Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets. This is the online module for Lecture 14, uh, Part 1. There's a lot of material to cover, so I've broken it into two parts. In this first part, we're going to discuss fixed income basics, and more specifically, we'll talk about bond yields, bond prices, and bond returns. Okay, so what are fixed income securities? Um, I'll use the word bonds to describe them for short. Uh, fixed income securities make fixed payments where a, a promise is made in advance. You know what you're supposed to be paid. Uh, these fixed payments can be specified either in nominal terms or in real terms. And we will talk more about real or inflation index bonds in a couple of lectures. So examples might be U.S. Treasury bills or bonds, uh, municipal bonds, uh, agency bonds, corporate bonds. We've, we've discussed those earlier in the semester. Now, there are two classic types of payment stream. In principle, a fixed income security can promise any stream of payments of an arbitrary shape, but the two classic examples are zero coupon bonds, also known as discount, discount bonds. These make a single payment at the maturity date, which can be normalized to $1 for convenience. Uh, and then coupon bonds pay C dollars each period up to and including the maturity date when they also pay $1. Again, the $1 is a normalization. So here's a timeline uh, starting at the present and looking forward into the future. Uh, we have T plus 1, T plus 2, and so on out to T plus M. Little m here is used to indicate the maturity date. A discount bond makes only a single payment. You see there's nothing happening all the way through here. And then it makes a single payment of $1 uh, at the maturity date. A coupon bond, on the other hand, will pay C each period up to and including the maturity date. All right, so start with zero coupon bonds. Uh, they don't, of course, make coupon payments. And almost always, they will sell at a discount, a price lower than face value, uh, because a dollar in the, pre in the present is worth more than a dollar in the future. So to get a dollar in the future, you spend less than a dollar today. Uh, so this uh, fact that they sell at a discount explains why they're also called discount bonds. So an example might be a five-year risk-free zero-coupon bond with a $1 face value. Face value is what is promised to be paid in the future. If that has an initial price of uh, 95 cents, uh, you're going to be compensated by the difference between the, the 95 cents you pay when you buy it and the $1 you'll get back in five years. Now, for coupon bonds, um, this uh, quantity C, which is the coupon per dollar of face value, that's known as the coupon rate. A coupon bond can, of course, be thought of as a package of discount bonds uh, with different maturities. And in fact, these coupon bonds are sometimes stripped into the individual payments, each of which is traded separately. So let me show you on the next page. Uh, here's a coupon bond, which is paying $100 coupon each period, and then in addition, $1,000 face value in the third period. So the cash flows are 100, 100, and 1100. Now that's equivalent of a $100 face value of a one year zero coupon bond, a $100 face value of a two year zero coupon bond, and an 1100 face value of a three year zero coupon bond. If we add up these three zero coupon bonds, we create a portfolio which has exactly the same cash flows as the coupon bond. So going back one slide, as a concept check, I hope it's obvious to you what the law of one price or the condition of no arbitrage implies for the price on the one hand of the coupon bond and on the other hand of the group of discount bonds, the portfolio of discount bonds, which, uh, which replicate it. All right, so now let's talk about uh, bond yields, prices, and returns. And we'll start with uh, zero coupon bonds, which are easier. The key concept here is the yield to maturity, or YTM for short. And the yield to maturity on a bond is that discount rate which equates the present value of the bond's payments to its price. Another way to put it, this is equivalent for a zero coupon bond, is that the YTM is the average return you get per period if you buy the bond now and hold it to maturity. So as an example, Recall that we introduced earlier a five-year zero coupon bond that sells for 95 cents. What is the yield on that bond? Well, we're going to find the, the, the interest rate, Y, such that 0.95, the bond's price today, equals 1 over 1 plus Y, the gross yield, to the power 5. 
And uh, all we're doing then is discounting the future value at the rate, the gross interest rate 1 plus y over 5 years, hence the power of 5, and that has to equal the current price. And we're just going to find the y which satisfies this equation. In this example, it'll be to two decimal places, 1.03%, uh, or 103 basis points, recalling that a basis point is one hundredth of a percentage point. More generally, let's just have the general formula. If PMT is the price at date T of an M period zero coupon bond, then the yield on that bond YMT is implicitly defined as the solution to this equation 1, um, that the price has to equal 1 over 1 plus Y to the power M. So we're just discounting the face value over M periods using this yield. Whatever number does the trick is called the yield to maturity. Now, uh, a key point, uh, and this is a very basic property of interest rates, is that the yield to maturity and the price are inversely related. Well, why is that? Because if the yield goes up, then we're discounting the future fixed payment at a higher rate, so the present value is lower. In other words, a higher Y corresponds to a lower P, and vice versa. Now let's uh, uh, think about how sensitive uh, the, the price is to the yield. Um, if we take the derivative of equation 1 and calculate dp dy, we're going to get minus maturity m times 1 plus y to the power minus m minus 1. Uh, now let's, uh, let's uh, rearrange and combine with equation 1. If we calculate the proportional change in the price, dpm divided by pm, uh, so in other words, we're just going to d divide this equation by P and multiply this equation by dy to get dy over to the right. We're going to get dp over P is minus m over 1 plus y dy. All right, so that tells you that for a zero coupon bond, the sensitivity of the price to a small change in the yield is equal to maturity divided by the gross yield. All right, so if we have, let's say, a... 1% um, change in the yield here, we would multiply this 1% uh, change by minus maturity over 1 plus gross yield to get the proportional effect on the price. So here is a, a figure from Bodie, Kane and Marcus, table 16.2, which shows prices of zero coupon bonds. So um, the, in this case, they've normalized the face value to $1,000. They have three different maturities, 1, 10, and 20 two different yields, 8% and 9%. They show the price that corresponds to each yield. And then they show you the, the, the uh, uh, percentage decline in price caused by an increase in yield from 8% to 9%. And you can see that in each case, the percentage decline in price is slightly less than the number of years maturity of the bond. So this is slightly less than 1% this is slightly less than 10, and this is slightly less than 20. Um, why is that? Well, looking back here, we, we, we should have the maturity, which is 1, 10, or 20, divided by uh, the gross yield. So that's the, 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 the extra piece that is we're dividing by, um, uh, you know, uh, a 1.08 1, 1 here in order to, to, to get these uh, smaller numbers. Okay, so that explains why the price sensitivity to the yield increases in maturity. I hope this table illustrates that uh, as interest rates move around, long-term bonds are going to have prices that change much more because any given change in yield is much more important for the price, the valuation of a long-term bond than of a short-term bond. Now we can also do this in logs, um, and this is what academics like to do because the equations look much, much simpler. If we take this equation that relates price to gross yield and simply take logs of everything. Little p is the log of big P, little y is the log of 1 plus big Y. Then we're going to get little p equals minus maturity m times little y. And everything, the relation between prices and yields is nicely linear in logs, which makes it much easier to do later analysis. So academics uh, tend to do this, practitioners don't, uh, but I'm going to show you quite a lot of analysis in logs. I'll just mention, we'll talk more about this in class, but the yield curve or term structure of interest rates 
is the set of yields at a given time on zero coupon bonds of different maturities. And here are some examples from the Wall Street Journal of a flat yield curve, an upward sloping yield curve, a downward sloping yield curve, and finally a humped yield curve. Now let's uh, introduce the uh, next concept, which is holding period return, or HPR. Um, when we compare yields to maturity on bonds of different maturities, we're really comparing apples and oranges in terms of the returns available. Because the two-year yield is a guaranteed return on a two-year bond held for two years. The five-year yield is a guaranteed return on a five-year bond held for five years. What we would like to know, of course, as investors, is which bond will give us a higher return over a given period. But by comparing yields, you're varying the period, so you're not, you're not looking at things over a given period. So to fix that, we can look at the holding period return, which is the return on a bond held for a fixed interval, and let's make that one year for convenience. So let's see how we calculate that. Suppose we buy an M period bond today when it has maturity M and sell it tomorrow when it has maturity M minus 1. Remember, its maturity will be declining as it gets closer to its maturity date. The gross return then, 1 plus RM T plus 1, the gross holding period return, is going to be the ratio of the price tomorrow, P M minus 1 T plus 1, divided by the price today, P M T. If we now substitute in the relationship between prices and yields, we can say that it's the gross yield when you buy to the power m divided by the gross yield when you sell to the power m minus 1. Now that formula is much easier to work with if we take logs. So little r is the log of 1 plus big R, and that's the change in the log price. Or it's m times the log yield when you buy minus m minus 1 times the log yield when you sell. And then we can rewrite that as the log yield when you buy minus a multiple m minus 1 of the change in the yield on the bond while you hold it. This is the yield when you bought it. This is the yield when you sell it. This shows you that the holding period return equals the initial yield to maturity only if the yield to maturity is unchanged during the holding period. If this and this are the same, the second term drops out and then the return equals the yield. But more generally, if the yield goes down during the holding period, that drives up the bond price and the holding period return, and vice versa. So in other words, to get a high return on a bond, you want it to have a high yield when you buy it, but then ideally you'd like the yield to decline while you're holding it, because that'll drive up the price. So that can be illustrated here in this diagram, um, where we have time on the horizontal axis going out to the maturity date M, and we have log prices on the uh, vertical axis. Now these log prices are negative because the the face value at maturity is 1, so the log of 1 is 0. So we know that at maturity the log price will be 0, and before that date it will be some negative number. Again, this is just because we took logs. So I've drawn here PMT, and if you hold to maturity you know the price is going to go from PMT to 0 in logs, and the average rate of return is going to be the slope of this line, this straight line, and that slope is uh, YMT. That's YMT is minus PMT divided by M. All right, so it's this divided by that. It's the slope of this line. All right, now the holding period return is the slope over the holding period. So if, for example, the price goes up over the next period up to here to PM minus 1, T plus 1, then you're going to get a higher holding return, a steeper line initially. Of course, that will have to be offset by a flatter line later, since over the whole holding period to maturity, you know you've got to end up going from here, excuse me, from here uh, to here. OK, now, uh, finally, in this part of the module, I want to generalize these concepts to uh, handle coupon bonds. Now, the yield to maturity on an M period coupon bond, I'm going to write that YCMT, where C is for coupon, M is for maturity, T is for the date we're looking at. It's defined implicitly by this equation, which says that the price of the coupon bond has to be the present discounted value of the whole stream of payoffs. All the coupons, each one discounted at the rate appropriate to its payment date. One coupon paid one period ahead, one coupon paid two periods ahead, and so on, until we get 1 plus C, a total payment of 1 plus C, 
payable at the maturity date, and that's discounted over m periods. So y cmt is implicitly defined as whatever number will uh, solve this equation and give you the correct uh, price. Now, it turns out that if the coupon equals the yield to maturity, if c equals y, then the solution to this equation is p equals 1. All right. In this case, the bond sells for its face value. We call it a par bond. All right. So, or I could turn this around and say that if we observe a coupon-bearing bond whose price is 1, then this equation will be solved by setting y equal to c. Basically, in that case, the stream of coupons that you get exactly offsets the discounting um, over time and the delay in the repayment of the principal, so the bond is worth exactly its face value today. On the other hand, if the coupon is smaller than the yield to maturity, C is less than Y, then the solution has P less than 1, because the coupons aren't large enough to compensate you for the time value of money. In that case, the bond sells at a discount. On the other hand, if the coupon is greater than the yield, C is greater than Y, then the solution is P greater than 1, because the coupons more than compensate you for the time value of money, and in this case the bond will sell at a premium. Now when coupon bonds are issued, they, they, the, the, the Treasury and other issuers will try to set initial coupons equal to yields at issue. So these coupon bonds tend to be sold initially at prices very close to 1, and then over time, as interest rates move, the price will move away from 1, depending on the direction of the movement of interest rates. Um, so here are, uh, here's an example from Bodie, Keane, and Marcus. This is the prices of 8% coupon bonds for different maturities and yields. Notice that if the uh, market interest rate is 8% and the coupon is 8%, then the price of the bond is $1,000. This is the, uh, normalized to a face value of 1000 The price will be exactly 1000 no matter what the maturity. That's the special case C equals Y. On the other hand, if the market interest rate is above 8%, then we get discounts, which get larger as you look further out. And if the market interest rate is below 8%, then you get premia, which uh, increase as you look further out. Finally, let me just mention um, the concept of a perpetuity. A perpetuity is a coupon bond that has no maturity date. It just pays forever. And in that case, the pricing equation for the coupon bond can be solved explicitly, and we get P equals C over Y. This is like the Gordon growth model with, with no growth. All right, And then we set the dividend from that model equal to the coupon, and the R from that model equal to the yield. And so in that special case, we just get P equals C over Y. And once again, of course, we find an inverse relation between the yield and the price. Thank you. This is the end of the first part of the online module for lecture 14.